Well, I'm going to speak about the midnight hour. We've all been there, haven't we? Oh, well, I have. You know, those days when it's difficult. Am I the only one who has difficult days? And not just over the build. One of the funny things about the midnight hour is it's very personal, but we've all been there. Men call it the man cave. <laughs> Women call it, I'm fine. I'm all... <laughs> Sorry, musicians. I just need the space. There we go. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it's, it's a funny thing, the midnight hour. And the interesting thing about the midnight hour is, in the Bible, it's really clear about how we can go through the midnight hour and come out the other side. Because there's no going past it, and there's often no going over it. Amen? I'm not saying God doesn't help us with problems. God helps us with problems all the time. But quite often God goes through us with the problem and releases us from the problem at the other side. But what he doesn't do is say, here's a balloon. Jump in the balloon basket and I'll just lift you over all those worries. And you won't have any worries. Amen? So most of us, not all, will have worries in our life. Now, all those worries are all different for all of us, and that midnight hour is different for all of us. But the interesting thing about the midnight hour that's the same is it always seems to be darkest just before the dawn. There's a moment in the midnight hour where it looks like nothing's going to happen. It looks like that's it. And in, in the Bible, in Acts Chapter 16, verses 20 to 40, which I'll save you from my reading. I won't read it out. I'm going to just tell you about it. There were two men, and they were in prison. Now, they were in prison for living the life that they were supposed to live, for doing the right thing because it was right to do, because they wanted to live the Christian life. So we've got this strange picture of Paul and Silas. They're in prison, and they're in chains, and it's the midnight hour. Now, one of the things I want you to see right before we start, because the midnight hour is a strange place. The midnight hour is a place where we often blame other people for being there. It's always someone else's fault. But sometimes, being in the midnight hour is our fault. One of the things I really love about the midnight hour, when you see them sat there, and their feet are in the stocks, and they're sat there, they're not saying, well, you couldn't just shut up, could you? You had to preach in the marketplace, didn't you? <laughs> well, you, they're, they're not sat having a go at each other because it was someone else's fault. Now, that's a really interesting thing, isn't it? Because as people, it's much easier for us to point our problems somewhere else rather than looking at ourselves. So that's what we don't see. What we do see is a picture and a place where these two, we know where they've been. Now, we've been there. That's the strange thing. Many of us have perhaps not physically been in stocks and chains. Perhaps not. Some of us might have, but most of us haven't. But we have been feeling beaten down, tired, defeated, overwhelmed by problems, issues in our life, perhaps issues that we don't tell anyone else, issues we don't talk about, issues we don't touch because it hurts too much. And we're just happy to bury them. And sometimes they come to us and we spend time in the midnight hour. Because we're people. We're human beings. And so what we see here is these guys, they're there in a place where we've all been. Now this picture is strange. Because in the midnight hour, in the worst moment, they begin to sing. It's their first thought is not to complain and not blame each other, not look for reasons why they're there. Their first thing is they start to sing. Oh, hallelujah. When all seems darkest, perhaps we should sing. I'm sure all the magicians are going, that's right. Yeah, Amen, I knew it all along. Hallelujah, well done, pastor. But everyone else is like, sing, really? <laughs> really? Right now? It's like when, I, the, the, I don't know if you ever noticed, the best witnesses I've ever had is when I least feel like it. Have you ever noticed that? God sends someone to talk to you about him when you least feel like it. 
I've even stood there and gone, really, God, in my heart? You know, really, right now? Because I'm trying to deal with this, and this person really wants to know about God. And so I'm forced to tell them, and by the end of it, I'm like, hallelujah, I've got a chance to talk about God. <laughs> because something happens, and there's breakout in the midnight hour. Now, there's so much to talk about the midnight hour, but I just want to really talk about three things. Paul and Cyrus find themselves in a cell. No windows. It's smelly, and it's dirty. And they've been, now let, let's, let's hear where they've been. They've been stripped, so they maybe don't even have any clothes on in the stocks and the chains. And they've been severely beaten. Now verse 23 says, severely beaten. So I'm figuring they didn't get a slap on the wrist. Amen. Amen. They didn't get a clip around the ear like when you were a kid. Well, my mum didn't never hit me around the ear. My mum was an expert with a wooden spoon. And she always made me wear, I'm reluctant to wear shorts even today. And she was really good at you. She could just get you just before you got out the door when you were trying to run away. But these guys have been beaten, not just given a talon off. So it's fair to say they've had a really bad day. Compared to some of our bad days, they've had a bad day. Hallelujah. Now who's had a bad day? Oh, wow, there's only a few of us. Hallelujah, we're a small group. We should get coffee after, discuss it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners are listening to them. What do we learn? The first thing we learn in verse 25 is this. When we go through trouble, other people are looking. What do they see? What do they see when they see you dealing with your problems and dealing with life and working it out? Are they, do they hear somebody moaning and complaining? Do they hear somebody getting upset all the time? Do they hear someone who's down? Or do they hear someone who actually says, hang on a minute, I have a redeemer, I have a helper, something is bigger than me, I belong to something bigger than myself, I'm not going to give in to it, but I have to go through it. Yeah. Amen? We have to go through it. There's no escaping bad times. There's no escaping big bills. I want someone else to pay them, but they never do. Hallelujah. No matter how much I pray. Lord, some, someone to pay this, but, and I always have to pay it. Hallelujah. The first thing then that we see, I'm just going to point out three things. I'm, a, I'm a usually a short preacher, so you might get to enjoy some of the sun. Amen. The first thing that we see is that they fix their eyes not on their circumstances. So in other words, they are not defined by where they find themselves. Amen. Sometimes our circumstances, we, we don't have any control over them. Things happen. Yes. But they are not defined by their circumstances and they fix their eyes and their hope on Jesus. Now, this seems obvious, doesn't it, here in church, but it's not so obvious when we're out there trying to work out life's problems and life's difficulties. And sometimes we need to stop and not be defined by our circumstances and not brought down by them. Otherwise, we will be dragged along by them. Yes? They will take over our life. They will control what we say, how we speak, how we think. And so they become what people see about us rather than them seeing Jesus or the fact that we are different in the world, which we are called to be. Amen? So we have a difficulty. We have to face it. We have to face up to it and say, these circumstances are not who I am, but I have to go through them. Can't ignore them, and they're not going to go away. Therefore, I must go through them in a way that glorifies God if I am calling myself a Christian. Amen. 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 If I call myself a Christian, I must then live the Christian life. No matter what's happening. Hebrews 12, uh, verse 2. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scored its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. They looked past their circumstances. See, Jesus was constantly looking at the goal. Now, Jesus is our example in all things, and Jesus constantly looks to the goal. This is where I'm going. This is what's ahead. Hallelujah. Our circumstances are often not infinite. They are finite. In other words, we are going to come out of it. How we come out of it 
defines us. Amen? How we go through things and how we come out of them, that's what makes us who we are. That's what made Jesus who he was. He kept his eyes on the goal. And the goal was you and me. The goal was to have relationship with us, to, have, to, to give himself to be sacrificed for us, for an atonement that we could never make, so that we could be with him in heaven. So his constant goal was there, not here. Not now, not in these circumstances. Not where I've been beaten and had my beard pulled out with pliers and had thorns put in my head and been scorned and mocked. No, that's not where I live. I don't live where my circumstances are. That's where I live. That's where I'm going. Hallelujah. Now we go through different things, all of us, but we keep our eyes on Jesus. That's how we get through. Because that's where we're going. Brothers and sisters, Hallelujah. Number two, as they pray and sing, because they know how to rest in God. Didn't we say that about the quiet? They know how to rest in God. They didn't sing because of the promise of escape and rescue. I want to say that again. They did not sing because they knew they were going to be rescued. That's not why they sung. So there's no promise and no hope of rescue. So no one was coming to fix their problem. No one's going to come and go, Ooh, you're free now. All a mistake. Sorry, come on, come. There was none of that. They sang because they knew that in their circumstances, the best thing they could do was to rest in Jesus. Was to give to God glory and hope. And God gave them peace. Because if they didn't have peace, they wouldn't have sung. Come on. If they didn't have peace, they wouldn't sing. Not in the midnight hour, not after all that had just happened, not after all they were going through, not in the circumstances they find themselves. They find themselves singing because they understand who they belong to. Oh, hallelujah. Do we understand today who we belong to? It's very important for us as Christians to understand our circumstances do not define us. I belong to God. Even if we sit here for the next 10 years, we will worship. Even if there's no hope of escape and no one's going to come and bail us out, we will worship. Even if we die, we will worship. What a dark place to be. What a dark place to sit in and say, this, my life's awful. This is a terrible, terrible situation we find ourselves in. Woe is me. No. No, that's not what they do. Paul so often tells us he is not strong because of who he is, but because of who God is in him. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful thing to be able to reach down inside ourselves and find Jesus. To find a strength we didn't know we had. To find words we didn't know we had. To find a motivation we didn't know we have. Because not because of us. Because we are just weak. Because we are bound by things. We are held back. But he is not. And when we look to him, we look past our circumstances. And we reach out into something else. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you glad today that you don't have to rely on yourself? Because you can't do it. We can't do it. We need him. And resting in him is often the best thing we can do to get through what we are going through right now. To get through to the other side. Amen. Praise the Lord. Habakkuk describes how all things, all the things are going wrong and breaking down. Um, but tucked away in verse 19, Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my God, my Savior. What a simple little line it is. Yet, so all the things are going wrong in Habakkuk's life. Life's falling apart. Life's miserable. Whoa, hang on a minute. But 
Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my Savior. Hallelujah. Acts 16.25. And as they did this, the other prisoners were listening to them. Make no mistake, people are watching you. Life's funny like that. I'm going to tell you something that you might not know. There are people in your life who want to be like you. There are people in your life who think that you, no matter what you think of yourself, are wonderful, amazing. You've got it all together. You've got all the answers. And they want to be you. They want to be just like you. Now, what do they see? The other prisoners listen to them. The other prisoners heard them. People who didn't know Jesus saw Jesus in them. But they saw something else. They saw men who trusted Jesus no matter what. Because these guys are all in chains. Can you imagine, like, will you shut up singing, guys? We're trying to sleep over you. Because they're in chains. It's the midnight hour. You know, it'd be like having a party in the flat upstairs. We're trying to sleep over here. But what they're doing is worshipping God and the prisoners are listening. And they see and hear people who believe in God. Who have put their hope in something besides themselves and besides other men. They've put their hope in God. Oh, hallelujah. I love that picture. How many of the people around us watch us when we're in our midnight hour? You know, I, when, I, when I first started work, well, I, I started work and um, I got a job in Dick Lawson's, which was out at High Connorscliff, and he used to sell engine parts for tractors, for councils. And I can remember, I, I'd been a Christian, oh, about three weeks. And I, you know what it's like when you're first saved, you want to tell everyone. I mean, you can't understand why everyone isn't saved. Why isn't everyone a Christian? Why isn't everyone on fire? Why doesn't everyone get it? So I'm going around and I'm giving out, I'm giving out the gospel, little Gospels of John. I'm giving out tracts. I'm inviting people to church every day, every day. I'm on fire. I'm at work. And I'm, they're getting a bit bored with me now. And anyway, one day we're putting up shelves. So I'm putting up shelves. And you know those rubber hammers that you use so you don't dent the shelves? I, I got one of those, smacked myself on the thumb. And to be honest, I didn't say, oh, goodness me. <laughs> it was not my first response. I was quite a young Christian. I've got to say those were the, not the first words. I won't repeat the words here. So, of course, everything stopped. Everything stopped at work. Thought you were a Christian. <laughs> they haven't listened to anything else I said for three weeks. Thought you were a Christian. People are always watching and listening. You know why? Many of them want what you've got, but they're scared. They're living in fear. Many of them are living in a midnight hour. They're scared. And so they watch you to see what you do. They watch you to see what you say and how you live. And you'll find over your Christian life, some people will even come to you and say, can you pray for me? What do people see when they see us? Number three, things happen when we pray. And stand in the midnight hour. When we choose to rejoice, when we choose to keep our eyes on Jesus, brothers and sisters, I've got to tell you, things happen. And we see here, Acts 16, verses 26 to 29. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open. Everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't kill yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked them, sir, what must I do to be saved? See, 
in the midnight hour, when we pray, when we worship, first thing that happens, the doors are open. Isn't it a beautiful picture? And there is freedom in worship in the midnight hour. Have you ever noticed how you feel in worship when you have to drag it out of yourself? When you come and you just don't feel like worship, but the worship is so anointed, you can't not join in. Have you noticed that sometimes when you go, I, I, I'm not going to say it's every time, that, that wouldn't be right. But there's times when you come to church and you've had a tough week and it's been a hard time and you get here and you realize like the worship is so anointed, I have to worship. I have to worship. I don't care about you lot. I didn't come here to worship any of you. I came to worship God. And I have to worship. And it draws, God draws it out of me. Why? Because I need him to. Because he knows where I am. He knew where they were. God didn't have to say, go knock on the doors. Excuse me, uh, Paul and Silas here. God didn't have to go looking in the cells to see where he was. God knew where they were. Now God knows where you are. In your midnight hour, in your darkness, in your weakness. You don't have to worry about God finding you. He knows where you are. And when you come to church and you haven't got anything to give, somehow you give something because God draws it out of you. How? By His Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. What a thought that God loves you so much. He will always find you. Even when you feel like He's far away. Even when you feel like maybe He's in the other room. Now who moved? If God feels today for you like he's been in the other room for a while, I ask you, who moved? Because my God is the same yesterday and today and forever. So I know he didn't move. Who moved? Perhaps in your midnight hour, you need to put some time aside and worship God. Perhaps in the midnight hour, we need to say, Lord, I need you more than ever. I need to give myself to prayer and worship. And doors, they were opened. There is freedom in worship in the midnight hour. Chains, they fell off. There is a truth that when we let go and let God, we worship in the midnight hour with our friends, the impossible becomes possible. You know what happens when the impossible becomes possible? The chains fall off. Because before that moment, it's like a big weight on your shoulders and you can't get past it and you can't get over it and you can't get by it and you know you need help and you cry out to help and God comes with the help, your chains fall off. And suddenly, you're lighter. Suddenly, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Suddenly, I can see where I'm going. The fog is cleared. I know where I'm at and I know where I'm going. God come to find you, even when you were in chains. Amen. Do you know what else comes? Captives are set free. Paul and Cyrus were living what they believed in a cell, in the darkness, in the middle of the night. The truth, and they knew that the truth in their hearts was what the others saw. So they wanted others to see what they had. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. That's sometimes difficult, isn't it? Uh, I don't know about you, but I always pray over my food. Wherever I am, I, 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 like to ask, I like to thank God for my food. Always do that. Restaurant, McDonald's, I don't care where I am. I stop, I bow my head, and I pray. And sometimes I get mocked. That's fine, I don't, don't bother me. But I always honor God with my food. Now, sometimes, some of us wouldn't do that. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't. I'm saying the captives are set free. And when the others heard it, they wanted it. Because all those prisoners, think about it for a moment. If you were in prison and you'd been in prison a while and the prison door suddenly fell open and there was an earthquake and it was all free, you could run away, you could run away. But the influence of Paul and Silas was such that when the guard comes and he's about to kill himself, Paul said, whoa, 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 dude, they're all here. They're all here. It's good. So even the unsaved oppressor finds favor in the eyes of the Christian man. 
It's quite an important lesson for us, isn't it? They didn't judge him. He might have been the one who beat them. He certainly helped because it was his job. He's the one who locked them up. He's the reason they sat naked and freezing cold in the middle of the night. Perhaps there's a lesson for us. As the chains fall us, let us remember grace and mercy and that what we have received, we need to give to others. Not always really good at that. See, the, the other people in the prison saw truth. John 8, 32. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the other prisoners were all set free by truth. Whose truth? Paul and Silas's truth, and God working through them. So if you think that God can't work through you, think again. Because God worked through Paul and Silas in the worst circumstances, in the worst place they could be in, God worked through them. And brought what? Salvation. Did you ever wonder why Paul, why, why does Paul have to say to the, to the, to the jailer, don't harm, harm yourself? I don't know if you ever thought about this. It wasn't just because he thought he'd done a bad job, you know. Because if, 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 if all, we all did a bad job at work and chucked ourselves on a sword, there wouldn't be many of us here, would there? Huh? Eh? Well, I mean, some of you are good workers, but I've been in trouble a few times, I'm sure. Don't harm yourself. Because in Roman times, if a jailer lost a prisoner, he had to take his place as the punishment. Don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer's reactions to, he see, to what he's seen and heard, he says this, what must I do to be saved? You see, the jailer knows what's going on in his jail. That's his job. He knew. He'd heard them singing. He might even have complaints from, will you shut them up? They're constantly singing and praying. Nobody's that happy. That's what I thought when I first went to a Pentecostal church. I went to a Pentecostal, it was, it, was a child, it was the children's fault. I blame my wife because I got saved, but it's my children's fault for getting me to church because it was a children's club. An East, I think it was an Easter club, actually. And they had a prize given, and they made me go. And, and I had to go because my wife was working. Ethna was working, so oh, you have to take the kids. And I sat there, and I'm not joking, they were so happy, clappy. Everybody was so nice shaking your hand, everybody wanted to say hello, everybody was singing and smiling, and, and some were dancing, it was horrible. <laughs> it was horrible because I didn't know anything about it, I didn't know what I'm seeing, but nobody's that happy. And we weren't even in jail. We hadn't been beaten. We weren't in the midnight hour. We were in church. And I thought, hmm, this is weird. The jailer sees all this that they've been doing, everything they've been through, everything that's happened in their life. He knows everything. And he sees something that he wants in them. Do people see something they want in us? It's a fair question, isn't it? Because we're not going through any of this. When we live what we believe, in the midnight hour, Things happen and lives change. I really believe that. I believe when we live for Jesus, in all circumstances in our life, when we live for Christ, circumstances change around us. Not just for us, but around us. People ask us to pray. People ask us why we're so happy. Oh, I love it when people say, why are you so happy? Well, let me tell you. Hallelujah. <laughs> what did you do when that happened to you? Let me tell you. The first thing I did was pray. Really prayed, yes. Did it help? Yes, it did. They were not backward at coming forward, were they? But the interesting thing is, they didn't do any of this for anyone else. They weren't in prison doing evangelism. I know, let's go, and, let's go get beaten up, stripped, beaten, and put in the stocks and chains so that we can evangelize the prison. That isn't what the scripture says. They were out being Christians. They were out being evangelists in the marketplace, they were arrested and they were put in prison so they were actually just living the life they believed in their heart to be true. Imagine that. 
That's all they were doing. They weren't worshipping for the other prisoners. They weren't worshipping to get set free. They weren't worshipping so that people would think they were good. They were actually worshipping to honour God and say, you know what, God? I find myself in a terrible place, but here's the thing. I love you, Lord. Here's the thing, Lord. I want you to know how much I love you. And Lord, please help these other prisoners. Oh, hallelujah. How often do we, when we're in a really bad place, how often do we pray for other people? Lord, please help these people who, please help the guy who put me here. Nowhere, nowhere do we see Paul or Silas say, Lord, bring a plague upon the jailer. Lord, bring low all those that persecuted me and put me here in prison. The Lord, shut the other prisoners up so we can more worship you. We don't. All we see is honor to God. All we see is devotion to the living God who had changed their lives and saved them from a life of sin. All we see is Christians loving on their God, no matter where they find themselves. In the midnight hour, things happen. I'll tell you what happens. Doors open, chains fall off, the captives are free, and salvation comes. Because they worshipped in the midnight hour. They didn't just sit in it. Brothers and sisters, how are we in the midnight hour reflects how we are in the morning. It's easy to be okay on a good day. It's a sunny day. Half of us will go home and light the barbecue and burn some food. Hallelujah. There's always something burns. It's easy to be good. It's easy to be okay. But do we worship in the midnight hour? And do we trust God in the midnight hour? And if you're struggling with that right now, please don't go home struggling. Please. There's no need. God come to set the captive free. He who is free is free indeed. We are not captive to our circumstances. We are not captive to the chains that bind. They will come off. He set the captive free. He doesn't bind them up. Amen. We are free, men and women. We are free to follow our God. We are free from chains, stocks. Maybe some of us have been beaten, whether that's emotionally, whether that's in real life. But we are free. I remember one last, my time's up. One last thing. I remember when I hadn't been saved more than about a year. And... I was walking home from church. I had a wonderful time. Oh, it was a mountaintop experience. You know, those meetings, it just, God had flowed in the house. It was amazing. I'm walking home, and um, all of a sudden, I saw, like, uh, like our sister, I saw a vision. I saw a vision of the man who stabbed me when I was younger. So all I could see for a moment was the, the face of this man who had stabbed me when I was about 16 years old. I got stabbed in the back. Another story. And... Um, I started to pray against it because this is the devil showing me this. So I prayed against it and I prayed against it and I prayed against it. I'm not going to be bound by this. And the more I prayed against it, the more I fought against it, it was like being caught in a net. The tighter the net got and I couldn't get out and I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. God, I thought you saved me free from this. I thought you set me free. I thought I was one of these captives in the midnight hour who had been set free. I don't understand. Three days and three nights. I virtually didn't sleep. I couldn't believe I was seeing this guy's face in front of me all the time. I was weeping. I was going to God. I got permission to go in the church. And I was in the church for hours praying all night. Just God, take this away. God, this take this away. I never stopped to talk to God. I just kept going at God all the time. I was like, I don't understand. And on the third day, I was sat there and, and, and suddenly I had nothing left to say. <laughs> I tried everything. And I just sat in a chair and... I said, God, you know what? I, I don't know what to do. And God spoke to my heart and he said, you know. I said, I said to God, I don't understand why the devil is allowed to show me this, to bind me in this way. And God said, the devil didn't show you it. I did. And I started to cry. I was like, I don't understand. Why would you want to hurt me in this way? And God spoke to me through his spirit and he said this, I don't want to hurt you. I want to set you free. This has bound you. You've been captive to this. You've been in stocks and chains. You've beat yourself with it. But I want to set you free. 
I want you to forgive him. I want you to forgive him and I want you to let go of it and I want you to move on from it. It's not that it didn't happen, brothers and sisters. It will always have happened. I've got a scar. It's always be there. But I'm, I was hanging on to it and it was binding me. The doors weren't open. I was in chains. I wasn't set free. I bound myself to what had happened to me and I'd let my circumstances define me. And I got on my knees that day in the church and I said, Lord, Lord, with all my heart, I forgive him. Lord, I forgive him. And, and please, Lord, save him. Come into his life. Set him free like you've set me. Give him the salvation you've given. Please, Lord. And I beg God. I was there. I don't know how long. I was there until the evening meeting started. I can remember. And I, and, and I wanted with all my heart to forgive him. And I had to repent. When I finished forgiving this man, I said to God, I, I had to go before the Lord and I had to repent because I had held on to it. So God's trying to take the chains and I'm there going, no, give them back. No, no, I want them, it's good. It's safe here. This happened to me. I'm justified because of it. And I, and I wouldn't let go of the chains, you see. I had to repent and say, God, I'm sorry. I can see that you have tried to help me now. You have tried to take these chains away, but I have tried to keep them. In the midnight hour, doors are open, chains fall off, captives are free, salvation comes. Brothers and sisters, don't let yourself be bound any longer by the midnight hour. Don't be bound by the darkness. Don't be bound by the lack of hope. Don't be bound by things from the past. Let God set you free. Let go. And let God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing picture. We see what you have done. These two men of faith in prison. But you, you didn't just set them free. But those around them. The jailer. You brought salvation from pain. You brought salvation from bondage. And, and Lord, help us not to hold on to the chains that bind us. Lord, if we become used to being in the stocks and in chains, help us, we pray. Set us free. Show us what we need to do. If we need to repent, Lord, I ask that you would help us to repent. Lord, Lord, if we need to just bow the knee, Help us to do that. We want to go further with you, walk with you. We want to live the life that you called us to. You came to set us free. And he who the Lord sets free is free indeed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.